Well, I think we can start the dance. What do you say, Pia? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think okay. we can make it all. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. And welcome back. This is the third new, brand new edition of the Scribo Seminar Series. This is organized by the ERC Inscribe Invention of Scripts and the Beginnings team um, based in Bologna in Italy. The third series since the pandemic struck us two years ago, and it has been a joy so far. So we've decided to continue. And we have two very nice pieces of news. The first one is that we have recruited the help of Professor Pia Campeggiani, who is a philosopher and an expert in cognitive studies, in emotions, and above all, the art of interdisciplinary curiosity. She's an associate professor here in Bologna, and we're so pleased that she's joined us as part of the team. The second piece of news is that the Scribble Seminars will take for this batch of lectures a cognitive turn. And you can see from the title, um, uh, Writing and the Brain, that our guest lectures will explore the relation between the brain and all modes of symbolic communication, not just writing, but writing is of course included. So we've decided that we wanted to invite neuroscientists, such as today, cognitive psychologists, linguists, paleoanthropologists, archaeologists, and of course, philosophers. We will look at emblems, we will look at icons, symbols, and signs from the deepest recesses of our history, from the Paleolithic times, to our current contemporary forms of expression to try and understand how all these signs, all these symbols, and writing too, can be inserted into coherent, recognizable, cognitive, linguistic, and also cultural and historic patterns. For your diaries, uh, our next guest is going to be Professor Mariana Bolognesi, who's based here in Bologna. She's just been awarded an ESC on a project entitled Ab Abstraction. Her title is Writing Beyond Words, Multimodal Metaphors and Symbols. We will welcome her here in two weeks time on the 20th of May. There is a slight change of time because she will be kicking off at 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time, Italy time. So take note of this slightly earlier slot for her talk. I'll now leave the floor to Pia, who will be introducing our very distinguished guest today, Professor Vittorio Gallese the, from the University of Parma for the opening uh, Scribo keynote seminar. And I will also welcome Vittorio too. I'm very sorry that I will be leaving in an hour, so I won't have a chance to ask him questions, but maybe via email. Thank you so much, Vittorio, for being here. I much look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Pia, over to you for your introduction to right. our keynote speaker. Thank you, everybody. So thanks, everybody, for being here. We are very, very happy to be kicking off this seminar series. I'm very grateful to Silvia, Mattia, and Ludovica for having taken me on board in this project, which I promise will be very, very interesting. And the opening itself is telling in this sense. So our first speaker, as you've been told already, and as you can see, is Professor Vittorio Gallese, who really needs no introduction. Uh, he was part of the team who discovered mirror neurons in Parma in the 90s. And since then, he has produced groundbreaking research on the impact of this discovery on social cognition. He is currently professor of psychobiology at the University of Parma and the recipient, the recipient sorry, of many important prizes and awards. He has been visiting professor in several universities in Europe and North America, including Berlin, London, and the University of California at Berkeley. He is the author of more than 300 papers and several books, including 2002 Mirror Neurons and the Evolution of Brain and Language, a later one on the birth of intersubjectivity, psychodynamics, neurobiology, and the self. And the most recent one, uh, which uh, was published in 2015, if I remember well, in Italian, and then it came out later for OUP uh, in an English edition, The Empathic Screen, Cinema and Neuroscience. So Vittorio, we're very, very happy to welcome you here. 
uh, and we're looking forward to hearing you, your talk on the artification of habits from tools to symbols. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Silvia and uh, uh, Pia, uh, for having me here with you today. Um, it's a privilege to open this series of uh, seminars, and I choose to uh, walk on thin ice, so to speak, by uh, presenting this working hypothesis uh, on uh, the origin of, of the symbolic dimension of our species, um, the artification of habits. Uh, this is going to be the outline of my talk. First, I would like to start uh, with uh, um, a minimal background uh, about uh, what does it mean for me uh, uh, to do neuroscience. Neuroscience comes in many versions and it is not irrelevant uh, uh, to pinpoint uh, on which basis I carry out uh, uh, my empirical investigation of the brain body. Then uh, the topic of today, we are the symbolic species. Uh, uh, so I will try to address uh, this um, uh, characteristic feature uh, that distinguish us uh, among other living creatures, starting from the notion of habits and social practices and uh, proposing the hypothesis that uh, one can spot a continuity in the evolution of uh, um, uh, cognitive technology, which led uh, from the discovery of tools to the creation of symbols. Okay. Let's start. Many, many years ago, uh, with Giacomo Rizzolatti, we were asked to contribute a chapter to this book, uh, this French book, uh, edited by a French philosopher, a, a phenomenologist, and a Wittgenstein scholar, Jean-Luc Petit, The Neurosciences et la Philosophie de l'Action. And in this paper, From Action to Meaning, uh, we wrote, the neurophysiological data we have presented here provide a new insight about the neural mechanism that might underpin the processes of object categorization and action understanding. We were referring to canonical neurons and mirror neurons. Both these processes in our perspective seem to be deeply grounded in the bidirectional relationship between agent and environment. This relationship is basically dependent upon action execution. Action appears to represent the founding principle of our knowledge of the world. And um, a few years later, uh, in the uh, proceedings of this uh, meeting organized uh, in Bremen by, by Thomas Metzinger, uh, the acting subject was the neural basis of social cognition. I wrote, our complex experience of the world is made out of simpler behavioral mechanisms very much as our cortical circuits are made of neurons whose activity is in turn made out of ions flow. In other words, among all these different levels of description, there is no ontological gap to be crossed, just a continuum of increasing organizational complexity. Neurophysiology in this view represents a sort of cognitive archeology. span And uh, since then, and particularly since the discovery of mirror neurons, which marked uh, the turning point in my career, no, not only from a scientific point of view, but also uh, from a more theoretical point of view, which deals uh, uh, with the purchase uh, of uh, realizing how intertwined human beings and primates in general are, even at the level of the neurophysiological mapping, mappings uh, of their uh, social interactions. Uh, the brain level of description, however, this is something to be there in mind uh, uh, to contrast uh, uh, a too much craniocentric uh, 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 way of doing uh, neuroscience. The brain level of description is a necessary but not sufficient condition for studying intersubjectivity, the human self, language, uh, and the production of cultural artifacts, which are only properly visible if coupled with a full appreciation 
of their intertwined relationship with the body. So the centrality of the body to understand uh, uh, not only the brain, but uh, more broadly speaking, uh, our human nature. Let me start with this uh, um, a quote from John Dewey. We are willing under hypothesis to treat all of human behaviors, including his most advanced knowings, as activities not of himself alone, but as processes of the full situation, organism, environment. The situatedness of our uh, uh, cognitive uh, practices, uh, which is uh, um, an unavoidable uh, starting point uh, if we want to uh, avoid the traps uh, of literally believing that just by asking questions uh, uh, to the brain, uh, uh, we may come up uh, with the wrong idea that the mind is only in the head. Let's watch this incredible uh, beginning of uh, um, one of my favorite movies of Stanley Kubrick. Amazing scene, uh, uh, which also, uh, if you allow me to say so, uh, betrays uh, uh, the vision of men uh, uh, entertained by Stanley Kubrick, that probably not coincidentally uh, films the discovery of, of an object as a potential tool uh, uh, in terms uh, of, uh, of, a, of a weapon. So the physical object is discovered uh, uh, to be possibly turned into, into a tool. Uh, through a progressive uh, uh, complexification uh, of the motor routines uh, required uh, to build it. Uh, but the question remains uh, whether it's possible to define a dividing line between uh, the creation of artifacts that serve as tools uh, with the moment in which uh, this uh, crafted objects become something different as possibly is this uh, hand axe which was napped around a, a fossil shell and uh, as soon as I discovered this image, I immediately thought that this uh, could uh, well have been uh, uh, a lot more than a tool, uh, but the uh, uh, Paleolithic equivalent of a Ferrari or a Maserati, uh, a status symbol giving power preeminence uh, to the owner uh, of these artifacts, uh, also in light uh, of its uh, uh, potential uh, beauty. But nevertheless, we will never know. Uh, as pointed out uh, very clearly by Leroy Gourin, the only biologically undisputable criterion to define the human dimension is the presence of the two, Lutibia. And um, in the course of uh, our investigation, uh, about uh, this aspect uh, uh, of human activity, we have discovered many different kinds of tools uh, 
we were able uh, to date back uh, as back as uh, uh, the time of Homo habilis uh, with Oldowan tools uh, to the Akurian Homo erectus, uh, finally to end with the Neanderthal and sapiens uh, tools, uh, which clearly uh, show uh, um, a much higher complexity uh, required to manufacture them as this spare, uh, which combines uh, uh, vegetable elements, uh, uh, um, the shaft, uh, and a stone uh, um, tip. For extended time periods, very little change. As uh, Michele Cometa, in this uh, wonderful book on literature and narrativity, uh, wrote uh, in 2017, it must be said that uh, the tools are also the product of a narrative behavior, such as the chaîne opératoire, after all, is the chaîne opératoire described, uh, discussed by Leroy Guran. It is the application of a temporal and operational sequence, a before, a during, and an after, but at the same time presupposes a narration because whoever creates an Olduvian pebble, a double-sided or a blade must be able to foresee, namely to imagine that a certain object may come out of a given stone and therefore must have a rudimentary idea of time and the possibility of imagining, if nothing else, what cannot be seen. Reading this work, we are immediately drawn uh, to uh, imagine uh, uh, a complex mind uh, to be able to entertain this uh, take on temporality. However, more recently, um, some colleagues uh, uh, made a brain imaging experiment, uh, teaching people uh, to uh, produce uh, uh, tools, stone tools, uh, and monitoring which part of the brain were activated uh, in the uh, motor processes uh, required uh, to produce them. And what they found is both uh, behavioral and brain activation data indicated that the initial stages of all the one tool making skill acquisition are primarily concerned with perceptual motor adaptation to task constraints, and especially the discovery and exploitation of object affordances, rather than with executive planning and problem solving. So we already here uh, are able to, uh, so to speak, deconstruct uh, the apparent cognitive complexity, which immediately bring us to think about conceptual knowledge, language, uh, and the like, uh, to locate at, at a supposedly uh, uh, a much uh, um, cognitively lower uh, level of implementation as uh, the brain areas that uh, appear to be uh, activated during this manufacturing uh, uh, process are the same that normally enable us uh, uh, to manipulate objects. But at some point in evolution, something absolutely new happened. And it is matter of discussion what this expression at some point uh, really means. Namely, utilitarian behavior, the behavior leading to the production of tools, led to the production of material symbols. The movements and actions that for millions of years have allowed the, the increasingly skilled and refined creation of tools and weapons, the killing of animals, the construction of shelters and huts, also started to be used to create objects of totally different types material object whose main purpose was to say or to represent something to someone else. The symbolic uh, 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 trademark uh, uh, of the species Homo sapiens uh, had been, has been uh, at the center of uh, a lot of theoretical uh, speculations. Here I want to uh, notably emphasize the, the the very uh, interesting and prominent contribution of Hans Cassier, who dedicated four volumes uh, uh, to uh, symbolic forms. Uh, in 1944, Cassier wrote, this world, the human world, forms no exception to those biological rules which govern the life of all the other organisms. 
Yet, in the human world, we find a new characteristic, which appears to be the distinctive hallmark of human life. Between the receptor system and the effector system, which are to be found in all animal species, we find in man a third link which we may describe as the symbolic system. This new acquisition transforms the whole of human life. As compared with the other animals, man lives not merely in a broader reality. Man lives, so to speak, in a new dimension of reality. It's a major turning point. So many questions, of course, arise. How did the new cognitive ability of symbol making emerge in the first place? Uh, one could speculate that symbol making be the externalization of pre existing uh, symbolic. Uh, what I want to do today is to challenge this assumption by positing that symbolic thought and symbolic making, symbol making, constitutively co determine one another. Once behavior is turned into habits and mere action gives way to social practice. A minimalist and neurobiologically plausible approach to the origin of, of the creation of material symbols, hints can benefit from the notion of habits and social practice. So let's see more closely uh, what do we mean by habits and social practice. Again, Dewey, habits may be profitably compared to physiological functions like breathing, digestion. The latter are to be sure involuntary, while habits are acquired. So from the start, we learn that habit belongs to the same continuum of natural behaviors, like uh, eating, breathing, digesting, and the like. Pragmatism is important also from my perspective, uh, from the perspective of neuroscience, because proposes a processual and physiological characterization of habits, considering humans as creatures of habits, which are conceived as vehicles of cognition. Not everybody agrees on that. For example, uh, a huge uh, camp in analytic philosophy, starting with Fodor, would strongly object uh, against this uh, hypothesis, treating habits as, as near uh, and dumb uh, behavioral habits, uh, which tell nothing about our cognitive life. But as often happens, uh, um, these people might turn out to be wrong. Habits consist of schemas of perception, thought, action, producing individual and collective practices, which in turn reproduce the generative schemas. The body with its motor potentialities, therefore constrains, limits, and dictates the range of possible practices. Because as a bodily creature, it is the body that uh, provides the range of potentialities that we can instantiate uh, in our transactions with the world. And are these very same potentialities with, uh, which provide uh, 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 um, the main scaffolding uh, uh, to design uh, uh, the world uh, in which uh, um, we display uh, our openness. The body determines social practices, but at the same time, the body is shaped by social practices. So we are in a loop. It is because of the reciprocity of body and social practices that cultural artifacts are created or so runs my hypothesis. Here is another of the fab four, so to speak, of pragmatism, uh, Pierce. According to Pierce, and this is a step forward, the habits give rise to symbolic expressions and produce meanings through what he designates as wood acts, that is, through dispositional potentialities that are both physical and mental at the same time. The definition of habits as dispositions can be connected to the notion of motor potentiality. Our brain body expresses, as I was saying before, the range of potential relations to the world that lead to the constitution of the relational self 
shaping and delimiting the horizon of the world we inhabit. One of the discoveries we made here in Parma is that part of your motor system can activate without producing any movement. Uh, the motor system, in other words, can uh, turn into action. A part of it can become active without producing action, but to map perceptual objects, space, three-dimensional objects, the behavior of others. We come to know and understand our world, our umwelt, through the relation of potentialities instantiated by our body, and in particular, by our sensory motor system. How can bodily motor potentialities or dispositions be turned into the production of material symbols? What role do repetition and ritualization play in shaping the symbol making practice? Here, the contribution of uh, uh, Bourdieu uh, comes handy. Here is a quote from his Pascalian Meditations. Social agents are endowed with habitus inscribed in their bodies from past experiences. These systems of patterns of perception, appreciation, and action allow them to perform acts of practical knowledge based on the identification and recognition of conventional conditional stimuli to which they are predisposed to react. Eight years earlier in the logic of practice, he wrote, the theory of practice as practice insists, this contrast, these two contrasts I think are very telling, contrary to positivist materialism, that the objects of knowledge are constructed, not passively registered and contrary to intellectualist idealism, that the principle of this construction is the system of structured, structuring disposition, the habitus, which is constituted in practice and is always oriented towards practical functions. According to Bourdieu, practices are acquired through mimesis. And, let me spend a few words on social practice theory by quoting a, a very concise uh, but uh, a clear definition provided by Monique Scheer a few years ago. In practice theory, subjects or agents are not seen as antecedent to the practices, but rather as the product of the practices. The subjects exist only in the context of the execution of social practices. The individual subject in the practice theory is not conceivable without the body. The materiality of the body not only provides the place for the competence, dispositions, and behavioral routines of the practice, but it is also the one on which and with which the practices work. The body is an actor and an instrument. Thus, the creation of symbols and the consequent cultural practices and cultural institutions emerging from the implicit knowledge, the complex set of uh, behavioral paradigms that individuals simulate and internalize mimetically due to the constant interpersonal relationship they have within their dense network of social exchanges. Anthropology is also highly relevant here. Before we were uh, discussing uh, uh, um, Carlo Severi, uh, here is another uh, prematurely uh, uh, passed away uh, anthropologist, Alfred Gell, uh, that in 1998 uh, published, uh, after, actually, I think it was published uh, uh, posthumously, uh, but still, even as a posthumous book, uh, it contains a, a lot of uh, uh, intuitions, uh, um, and it's a it's a book uh, which um, can be really inspiring uh, if, particularly if read uh, nowadays uh, with what we in the meantime understood uh, about uh, the brain body. For uh, Alfred Gell, following peers, the cultural artifacts and what we now designate as works of art are indexes that these agents endowed with intentionality, evoking abduction, a form of conjectural inference that goes from the consequences 
back to the causes, thus allowing to appreciate the intentionality that led to their construction. And here, in terms of motor abduction, I think I can provide a nice example after one of our experiments, uh, trying to chart what's going on in the brain of people beholding uh, abstract art like uh, the cats on canvas by Lucio Fontana. Something similar indeed happens in our brain when we observe the cats uh, by Lucio Fontana. The consequences of the artist's action, the cats, lead to the simulation of their causes, the gesture of the hand producing them as uh, uh, testified by the activation of, of uh, the motor part of the brain of the still uh, beholders. Again, gel, before being a system of symbols, which clearly is, art is a system of action. Cultural artifacts exert an action on the world. Uh, gel writes, art is a system intended to change the world rather than encode symbolic propositions about it. Visual art objects are not a part of language, nor do they constitute an alternative language. And uh, more recently, here yeah, I want to justify uh, one term which I put in the title of my talk, artification. Um, a notion discussed by Nathalie Heineck and Roberta Shapiro, uh, who are both uh, in Paris. Uh, uh, Heineck uh, is a, a sociologist of art and uh, Roberta Shapiro, I think, is an art historian. Uh, they wrote, artification is a dynamic process of social change through which new objects and practices emerge and relationships and institutions are transformed. A few years later, the anthropologist Erin de Sanayeti on the same topic uh, uh, wrote, we advocate continuing to use the term rock art. And here we have a beautiful um, example which I think is also reproduced in uh, Silvia Ferrara's uh, last book, uh, Il Salto, The Jump. We advocate continuing to use the term rock art, but with a qualification, that art be considered as an abbreviation, as it were, of the abstract noun artification, from our newly coined verb artify. This reconceptualization considers rock markings not as things, objects, images, or works that can be called art, but as the outcome of an activity. So, the hypothesis is the following. The creative gesture that infuses material objects with meanings that transcend their immediate practical advantages could be the result of the fortuitous discovery of single individuals, subsequently mimetically shared as social practice by other members of the social group, becoming the object of ritualized practices. Object like this, this uh, shell with this incision, remarkably uh, reminiscent of these other markings, uh, uh, which were found in this piece of ochre dated 77,000 year before now in the Blombos Cape near Cape Town in South Africa, this shell, I think, if I remember correctly, came from, from Indonesia, from Asia, and at the least, uh, they all share a similar pattern of signs. Object like this could be the lay translation, this is my hypothesis that I would like to discuss with you today, of individuals fortuitous empirical observation. When, for example, cutting something on a rigid surface, the cutting activity leaves a permanent trace on it, thus revealing that the practice can persist as a material sign that supports it even when the practice is over and its agent has long since disappeared. This discovery could have been favored by the constant exposure to the lived relationship uh, uh, between traces of animals and absent animals, a, a form of uh, intrinsic or natural abduction, uh, to use a, a Pierce definition. The deer footprint stands for the deer, although it is not present. However, it is my uh, proposal, this observation may not have been sufficient 
to lead to the intentional realization of symbolic objects. My hypothesis is that something more is needed to create symbolic objects, namely the possibility to internalize the causal relationship between action and sign by its actualization through one's own bodily action. Once the connection uh, between action and outcome becomes explicit and self-evident in the eye of its inventor, it can be thought about, and most importantly, it can be displayed and communicated to others, hence triggering its mimetic diffusion within a given social group. A further element that might have contributed to the diffusion and consolidation of the production of symbolic objects of cultural artifacts is the repetition and its formalization into ritual behavior. Why? Repetition is a very efficient means to learn something new. When learning a new skill, it is common practice to mimetically repeat instruction, display behavior, uh, with many repetition cycle time and time again until the gap between what has to be learned, reproduced, and what is reenacted narrows down and eventually disappears. With ritualization, we have the transformation of behaviors initially repeated for mere learning purposes into a set of practices that provides greater social cohesion and sense of uh, communal belonging among its practitioners. So there is a sort of a snowball effect uh, in terms of social competence and institutionalization of uh, a community of um, human uh, living beings. So ritualization as cultural performance, uh, its relevance to the expression of symbolic forms. Ritualization is a term commonly used in biology and zoology. It is defined as the evolutionary process by which an action or pattern of behavior in an animal loses its original function, but is maintained for its role in showing itself to the other or in other social interaction. So it's a very Darwinian account, uh, not very different from the hypothesis put forward in 1872 by Darwin on the origin of the facial display of emotions. Here is a, uh, another anthropologist, Victor Turner, a ritual is a stereotyped sequence of activities involving gestures, words, and objects. And a very interesting book on rituals uh, is by the late uh, Catherine Bell, another anthropologist uh, who uh, showed that the implicit dynamic and end of ritualization, that which it does not see itself doing, can be said to be the production of a ritualized body. A ritualized body is a body invested with the sense of ritual. Since ritual analogies powers beyond the invention of the community and implies correct and incorrect relation with these powers, it is often more likely to generate a social consensus about things. Activities that are so physical, aesthetic, and established appear to play a particularly powerful role in shaping human sensibility and imagination. So there is a further element that, that most likely uh, help in consolidating these uh, uh, bodily social practices that through uh, mimetic activity, repetition and ritualization uh, acquire the status of uh, 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 culture uh, in, in, in the way we conceive uh, uh, the world nowadays, because they, um, so to speak, externalize the, the authority presiding of the repetition of those ritualization. And by deferring to an external entity, a God, uh, uh, a natural presence, a spirit, uh, um, or the like, uh, um, attributing uh, to this external uh, uh, object uh, the responsibility uh, uh, for the instantiation and the repetition uh, of these uh, ritual practices, uh, they may more easily uh, spread and consolidate, most likely. Examples of ritual-like behavior demonstrate, continues Bell, uh, the importance of the body and its way of moving in space and time. The body acts 
within an environment that appears to require it to respond in certain ways, but this environment is actually created and organized precisely by means of how people move around. By means of the ritualization of shared social practices, I posit that individuals' imaginary worlds colonize the social community they belong to, in allowing to infuse new cultural meanings into reused bodily performances through the repetition, combination, and memorization of particular shared behaviors and action and their mimetic ritualization. So there is a flow um, from repetition, combination, and memorization of social practices that through ritualization uh, stabilize, uh, confer uh, to a given uh, manufactured object uh, the status uh, of symbolic object. There are many symbolic practices in human culture. So uh, dance uh, uh, is a clear example and most likely one of the pristine, uh, most pristine example of uh, uh, symbolic behavior. So what's the difference uh, of uh, uh, this kind of uh, symbolic science uh, and, and these sorts of symbolic science? Ritualized performative practices like dance, uh, as I said, can be symbolic too. However, I, I, I contend they are confined to the here and now of the body. While by means of performative symbolic object externalization, cultural artifacts surrender meaning from the temporal finitude of the body and can be transmitted uh, through generation and generation for millions of years, most likely, uh, as we are about to learn on a daily basis, uh, predating uh, the origin of symbol making. So to conclude, Several important aspects of human cognition and culture share a performative character. I hope I, uh, uh, to have convinced you of that. That is, they qualify as mediated forms of action. Through the repetition, combination, and memorization of particular shared behaviors and action and their mimetic ritualization, the social group, through reuse, infuses bodily practices originally evolved for utilitarian purposes with new cultural symbolic meanings. This gradual transition from the creation of tools to the creation of symbolic uh, objects that I just proposed, uh, I think offers few advantages. Why? First, because it shows that utilitarian and symbolic behavior are both chapters of the same trajectory of cognitive technology, so it's in my opinion, highly plausible from an evolutionary point of view, rather than thinking about uh, cognitive deus ex machina events, like uh, the mutation of the FOXP2 gene, uh, which Pinker uh, designated as uh, um, the gene of syntax. I think it's much more plausible, um, a continuous uh, uh, trajectory. Second, does not require one to assume that the creation of symbols is the late externalization of a pre-existing symbolic thought, just because symbolic thinking and the creation of symbols, as I said, are the co-constructive result of the development of shared practices and habits. And finally, it is fully compatible with the neurobiological characterization of human relational potentialities as instantiated by embodied simulation. And this is it. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Vittorio, for this very, very rich presentation. I'm sure there are plenty of questions for you. I do have questions myself, but since I know that Silvia cannot be with us much longer, I'd like to ask her if she wants to ask you a quick question now before she has to go. No, Pia, Pia, I have 10 minutes. So off you go and then I'll join in. Oh, okay, yeah, right. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if I can break the eyes. I don't even know if that's an English, if you can say that in English or it's just about translation of an Italian idiom. But yeah, so um, I, I was very fascinated by many of the things you said. 
And I have two points on which I would like to uh, call your attention. So the first point has to do with uh, what you said is the co-determination of symbolic thinking and uh, um, symbol making. So it's not this, a linear sequence. It's not that symbolic thinking comes first and then as an output, we have the, the production of symbols, but they co-determine each other. So I immediately thought to what for, has been called uh, uh, epistemological tracking tools, I think, I can't remember the exact phrase, epistemic tracking tools, I think, by, by Richard Mannery, and all the work is done on, um, well, on symbol making and extended yeah. cognition, memory, and I was thinking whether you believe there is something more than memory. Uh, um, that comes out of this code determination. So, so what do symbol making does symbol making let us do uh, uh, that we couldn't do if we didn't produce symbols? So, so what is the way this technology interferes with with or in implements our uh, cognitive processes? And the second thing has to do with the. Uh, um, the first formulation of your hypothesis, I don't know if you can go back to that slide, uh, um, when you say that uh, it doesn't matter actually, I, I can summarize it uh, uh, for everybody. So I think you say something like that you believe that, uh, that symbol production started with uh, uh, a serendipitous discovery. Yeah, that's, that, that's a possible scenario. It's exactly. my just so story. On the and then you say, and subsequently, that was picked up and uh, and imitated. Yeah. And so uh, I was thinking, what about uh, shared intentionality as a starting point? So a social starting point rather than a subsequent uh, event. Uh, I was thinking, I don't know, when a monkey points some object, that's because they want it. If I point to an object, it's, that, it's because I want you to look at it with me. So I was thinking of Tomazello and that kind of, of suggestions. So what, what do you think about that? How, how sad intentionality might have been at the origin of symbolic uh, production and thinking at the same time? Okay, uh, let me uh, start from your last question. Shared intentionality is clearly uh, whatever we mean by that, which is not entirely uh, clear to me, uh, particularly if I think about uh, how John Searle uh, tried to address uh, um, this topic. But anyway, uh, the idea that uh, uh, shared uh, goals, uh, intentions, outcomes uh, uh, provides a, a glue uh, which in a way enable individuals within a cohesive, uh, cohesive uh, social community to produce something uh, uh, bigger and larger than the, the simple sum of the individual contribution. I think it's an undisputable uh, aspect on the basis of what we know from a variety of sources, um, anthropology, developmental psychology, infantile research, uh, uh, ethology, and the like. To which extent uh, this uh, might uh, have been uh, the crucial element uh, uh, to, uh, to have symbolic objects to take over, uh, it's, a, it's clearly a possibility when I, when I say uh, that uh, uh, it has been consolidated by means of uh, mimetic uh, behavior and ritualization uh, uh, I, I need that. Uh, I, I, I mean that probably you need to have uh, uh, um, uh, a minimal amount uh, of uh, 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 shared uh, 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 vision uh, of this practice uh, for it uh, not to be washed away uh, in the course of, uh, of evolution of a given species. Uh, I am not sure whether um, uh, symbols have been invented uh, as a, um, a collective outcome of shared actions or intentionality. Uh, uh, one way to go uh, uh, following this uh, trail uh, is dance. Dance probably uh, is a clearly a coordinated activity uh, through which a sense of cohesion, we have the synchronization of bodily movements, uh, and now people uh, are studying synchronization uh, as um, an important element 
in social interaction in defining stereotypes. Today, I was lecturing a medical undergraduate uh, on the relationship between synchronization of behavior between physician and patients uh, and the uh, um, experience of pain. So no question about it. Uh, it's possible that there were several individuals uh, that made the same, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, discovery that they, they found it uh, compelling that uh, something was left of their practice uh, and this uh, leftover could designate the practice to be shown to someone else how to do it. I mean, we can build a lot of alternative narratives, uh, um, but I'm, I'm inclined uh, uh, to, to believe uh, that uh, it was uh, utilitarian behavior that led uh, to the discovery that through the same practices or through slight modification of the same practices, uh, a, a symbolic object could be accomplished uh, and not uh, uh, putting the symbolic uh, at the first place. I think it's, a, uh, it's a, probably an undesired outcome of some serendipitous observation. That's my possible scenario. Of course, I wouldn't hang myself on that, uh, uh, but um, uh, we can only speculate, so why not speculate? And coming to the first question was... Uh, um, so it was about how you, how you understand co-determination, in what ways you think that... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I think uh, in, in that respect, uh, you, were, you, you were mentioning Richard Menary. I could, I could have mentioned uh, the material engagement theory, Lambros Malafouris. So the idea of uh, seeing... Uh, concepts that we normally employ uh, when we speak of the, the, the high level of human cognition like symbol uh, and the like more and more on, on the one hand in, in, in performative terms and in, on the other hand in relational terms uh, with, a, with, with a strong uh, uh, externalized contribution, contribution of, of, of the external world. I think uh, this is a trend uh, which is partly captured by the, the 4E uh, of embodied cognition, embodied embedded uh, um, uh, external uh, and uh, inactive. Uh, I think these are all elements that are uh, slowly but steadily influencing this kind of debate uh, among different disciplines and which I, tend to like because I think we are moving uh, in a very promising direction altogether. Right, Th thank you very much. Silvia, I think you can kick yeah. in. Thank you so much, Vittorio. It was truly engaging, very rich, very a lot of, of stuff on the plate to discuss. And I'm so sorry that I have three minutes for two fired questions. One is the role that's played by images because you compellingly set out the relation between tools and symbols, but then, and I, I'm, I'm completely with you when you say that for a symbol, it takes a lot more than what we see at the Blombos cave imitational pattern of, of reticulate signs. Um, when we do see images, in the Paleolithic and the figurative and the very, very clearly in contour lines, what do we make of those in their relation to tools? And the second question, very much into your idea um, taken from the two brilliant um, uh, devices of the artification definition um, that see rock art as a process of or the outcome of an, of an activity rather than art for art's sake. I, I've always thought that. I've always thought that, that the images that we can't really decipher from ancient times need to be set out and explained through a descriptive pattern that's not just, you know, through the vague definition of art. There's much more to them than, than that, which is not enough for me. So the outcome of that sort of ritualized conventional activity through repetition, through patterns that are clearly set out in sequences, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm really, really very much into that. That was enlightening to me. Um, what is the role of language in that? 
So two very basic questions, the role of images and the role of language in all of this from- Okay, to yeah. Okay. Uh, as, as the uh, um, archeological record uh, clearly show, um, we have images of a variety of kinds and you, you cover all of them in your book, in your last book. So we have uh, geometric uh, images like those uh, in, in the, engraved in the piece of ochre in Blombos. And we have uh, more naturalistic uh, images, uh, the images portraying animals, uh, portraying humans, uh, on average, I would say animals are much more uh, portrayed naturalistically than humans are. Um, incredibly, there is very little about um, uh, a still organism like trees, flowers. There's a lot of animals. So the kinetic aspects seem to be dominant, at, at least uh, in the Paleolithic uh, uh, caves uh, in Europe, Las Gauche, Ove, all these uh, clearly show the, the kinematic nature and probably the kinematic purpose of those images. Those images uh, uh, required, uh, were, were made in such a way to engender the illusion of movement. Uh, uh, and there are people venturing also to speculate that what we have there, it's a kind of multimedia production because also the selection of the location in the cave with a particular resonance might have been uh, chosen with a specific purpose to, to produce uh, some sort of uh, mediatic uh, event. So we are already dealing not just with images, but most likely uh, images that at the same time are dispositive, okay? Uh, of course, we don't know anything about the gaze mm. uh, that was looking uh, at these images uh, with this, uh, uh, this positive. Uh, so I have no answer about the relationship between uh, the, the symbol uh, derived from tool making and the image, if by image we, we refer to uh, an, a naturalistic uh, image portraying humans or or animals. Uh, it is also unclear to me who, uh, I'm not an expert in this field, but I constantly ask all the people who were expert in the field about this topic, whether figurative come first, abstraction come mm -hmm. first, uh, they develop uh, in parallel. I think you address the same in your book and there is no final answer um, as far as I understand. For example, if you speak to Carlo Severi, when I dared many years ago uh, to proudly uh, discuss with him my reading of Walter Ong uh, and Havelock, uh, uh, the old uh, story about Luria uh, mm -hmm. making the experiment uh, with the saw, the tree, and the hammer, and according to the literacy, the conceptual grouping uh, was different, stuff like that. Uh, he was... Uh, shutting me up and sell up. You, um, you can dispose of that. And his opinion was, was the opposite, that uh, you, you need a, a, a much more sophisticated cognitive system mm -hmm. if you want to create a society without literacy than actually having literacy. And uh, uh, much of his research is just on, on, on the transition between um, orality and literacy. So, of course, um, I cannot answer your very fundamental question. I'm, I have no data, I have no tool, I have, I have no means to, to answer that. But I think in a way you did answer. I mean, you've given me scope to investigate this further. And I, I love it that when you mentioned animals, a cat appeared. That was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Vittorio. I'm going to bid you all farewell. I have to go, but I'll see Bye. you next time, everybody. Thank you, Vittorio. Thank you, Pia. You can, continue, you can continue discussing, of course. We shall. I uh, shall ask the audience. I'm sure there are many questions. So just raise your hands. And is there, let me see. Okay, now I'm back.
in the gallery view. So is there anybody who would like to ask any question, make a comment? Right, Joan, please. If you can turn on the video, that's perfect. Uh, okay, sorry, one second. Yeah, no, we still don't see you. We see that you have turned it on, but we don't see your image, but we hear your voice. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Maybe I can, uh, I can just speak. Um, thank yeah, you again, uh, Professor Galesi. Um, uh, for that talk. So I always wonder on the relation between psychophysics as, as the people who study that, you know, conceptualize it and the role of the, the meaning value, the affordance and the symbolic value of objects, um, particularly as there have been some criticisms for an activism uh, in which they say, well, kind of the, the symbolic or the meaning aspect is just the last stage on a long um, sequential process. You know, you get the photons in the retina and then all the V1 v to V4 and so on. Um, but there, also, there seems to be, it has to be some way that these two things connect because it often seems that from the pragmatist and the phenomenological tradition, we see the cup as something to drink from. We see um, the symbolic art as what it symbolizes, if it symbolizes power, if it symbolizes wealth and so on. Um, but there's also, I, I guess we can't deny that there's a, there's a psychophysical process that's linear and sequential, even if at the phenomenological level, we see the, the function or the symbol inherently and seemingly immediately. Um, so I wondered uh, the, how you saw the best way of fitting together the, 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 the kind of the raw visual perception uh, of the objective properties of an object and then the perception of its meaning or its symbolic value. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, just not an easy question. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, I think nobody has a final answer to this uh, question either. Uh, yeah. um, what I can answer uh, is the following. Um, a good starting point, at the very least, to start answering this fundamental question would be to conceive of visual perception as not exclusively the outcome of the activation of the so-called visual brain from the retina to V6, so to speak, or uh, just to, to, to be within the limit of Van Essen, the, the, the visual limit of the map of Van Essen to the posterior part of the parietal Vision, I think it's clear now. Uh, it's multimodal. You don't see only with uh, your uh, uh, geniculate nucleus of V1 or V6 or V4 or V5. You see with your tactile brain, you see with the emotional brain, you see with the motor brain, there's plenty of example of that. So uh, if vision is multimodal, if looking at an object is not only the psychophysical recording of its shape, contrast, contour, size, orientation, but it includes also its uh, uh, status, as the potential object of a pragmatic relation, uh, the notion of affordance uh, clearly uh, states that, uh, then we acquire a, a notion of meaning, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, in, in a way, more biologically plausible. And in this, at the same time, uh, uh, we simplify uh, uh, the uh, the attempt to, to translate uh, uh, the notion of attributing meaning to objects uh, and uh, the neurophysiological underpinning. Uh, if instead uh, we, we entertain uh, uh, a, a vision, a, an exclusively visual account of vision, uh, if you allow me to say so, uh, then uh, you have uh, the problem of this uh, uh, multi-layering and the uh, uh, problem of reconciling uh, the intuitive quality of the meaning of an object, which occurs uh, within a fraction of a few hundred milliseconds as soon as you gaze the object, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 the necessity uh, to, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, to reconcile this immediacy with the model that instead uh, 
uh, implies a multi-layering, a multiplicity of step, uh, of boxes, of flow charts. Uh, that uh, is partly probably produced by an incorrect uh, uh, take of what uh, uh, vision really boils down. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I at least partly answer your question. Yeah, yes, very much. Thank you, Professor. Right. So there is Derek as well. Derek, please, can you turn on your mic and your webcam, if possible? Well, I see he is. There is a raised hand there on your on his icon. Maybe are you? Can you hear us? Mm, there might be some issue with with his connections or something. So we may, is there anybody else? Okay, Anna. Oh, uh, Anna, I, sorry if I, uh, I just say two words to introduce you because uh, Anna Bonifaci is one of our speakers. So she will also give a talk in this seminar on the 1st of July. So you'll be all informed about that. And I'm very uh, glad I can introduce you to each other, Vittorio and Anna. So I please. Like to meet you. Yes, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Pia, and uh, nice to meet you, if, if Vittorio, if I, if I may. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you so much for this very, very inspiring uh, talk and, and all, all your thoughts. I have two minor points that probably sound just naive, even naive, So, but I, I'm, I'm thinking from the perspective of someone who is now working at, the, at a linguistic department, I'm here at the University of Cologne um, in Germany, and uh, I'm very much interested in the, um, uh, let's say, in the theoretical implications, cognitive and semiotic implications of multimodality in general. So my points are, 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 are this one. So um, from your explanations uh, 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 about objects, um, how possibly we can connect uh, uh, symbolic objects to, to the instrumental um, idea, the, the, this, this kind of major uh, thought about action, how fundamental uh, is action in determining uh, the, uh, even the symbolic level of the object itself. So would you see some compatibility between your, your views, your thoughts, and... Uh, what uh, some at least cognitive linguists call the, the frame metonymy mm, you know, idea, which means you know, could objects, symbolic objects be in a way taken as um, metonymic entities because they uh, basically they activate access to immediately access to a, a frame, a, a frame that is, for example, I don't know, the process uh, through which the object is produced, uh, the story behind the object, uh, um, the way in which the object is supposed to be used. I, I don't know, I mean, there are several directions of these frame, met metonymic frames, but would you say that these might be compatible as, as, a, as a kind of a, a conceptualization of how symbolic objects uh, fit very well, uh, this kind of larger, um, larger picture, uh, cognitively speaking. That's my first note. The second note uh, is that it seems to me that you are very elegantly bridging a major gap uh, between uh, different affordances of, of items. So, I mean, in the moment in which you are um, uh, showing that a symbolic object that is a static object yeah. in eventually might, might be um, very much evocative of something dynamic moving and that has a kind of a motion behind uh, 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 an artifact that has a kind of a handcraft, uh, a performative, the performative level basically behind the symbolic objects. It seems to me that this is marvelously bridging the gap with affordances that traditionally are just belonging to things that unfold in time. Uh, in other words, I mean, it sounds to me that you, in light of you, your thoughts, we might end up seeing at least a continuum between, let's say, something like an Armenian cross, 
just to mention randomly, you know, an object, <laughs> a symbolic <laughs> object, and I don't know, a prelude uh, um, um, of Chopin that that is, you know, that has affordances only to the extent that it is. Um, unfolding in time, like speech, you know, uh, music is like speech, something that uh, uh, obeys what what Gunter Kreskrock called it, the logic of sequence. And so, whereas prototypically a static object uh, has other affordances, but it sounds to me that your way of 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 thinking about this is bridging this gap. So, on the level of performative performativity, which I find very very attractive. So I don't know. I, I I'm just asking how yeah. you react to this. Thank point. thank thank you for your your very uh, deep and, and interesting comments. Uh, I'm I'm reading a book by uh, Pietro Montani, and one 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 topic of the book is the relationship between. Uh, uh, word and images, particularly in the digital age. And he, he quotes um, in one chapter, Il discorso della pittura uh, of Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, as you were speaking, I was um, recalling uh, a few pages I read uh, last night um, that Pietro is commenting on. So the, the relationship between the simultaneity, the holistic quality, of a static object uh, and uh, which would in principle constitute an advantage with respect to a, a more diachronical uh, uh, um, symbolic activity like for example uh, music. And I think uh, um, uh, they are both exploiting um, um, reusing uh, the same uh, constitutive uh, basic elements, so to speak. Uh, because even in a static object, it is included uh, the possibility to induce uh, movement if only uh, simulated, you see? Just because of this uh, uh, property of, uh, of uh, sensory motor abduction uh, between the trace, which I, I discovered Incredibly, uh, not incredibly, it's incredible that I had to discover it. It's the other way around, but uh, it's fully consistent with the, a variety of tradition of thoughts. It has been uh, maintained many times in many different contexts. Uh, today, I quoted uh, a Pierce. Uh, um, in another talk, uh, I quote von Hildebrandt, uh, which make, uh, who's a, a sculptor and an and, and art theorist, uh, uh, at the end of the 19th century, and uh, he makes exactly the same point. So I'm a continuist. I, I, I imagine uh, it might have transpired uh, from my talk. So I see. I think, that at least from my perspective, what provides the bridging elements is the body, basically, and, and the way the body works. So if we stick to the body, I don't think we can solve all problems. Many problems are probably unsolvable, but we can solve a great deal of more problems than we can accomplish if we follow an alternative route like uh, the standard uh, cognitivist account of uh, manipulation of symbols, uh, the algorithmic uh, take on, on symbolic talk, so to speak, which doesn't imply that we cannot model the brain as an algorithmic machine. We can do it uh, and it works, uh, but it's not the whole thing, uh, you see. Thanks, many thanks. Right, so there's still some time for another question. If anybody would like to ask. So I see Giorgio. Giorgio Volpe is a colleague from the department uh, of Bologna. So thanks for coming, Giorgio. Thank you. Thanks to Professor Gallese right. for this very rich and very inspiring talk. Uh, actually, mine is, is more a, a, clarificatory, a clarificatory question. Uh, that's a lot to do with the, your use of the notion of habit. I'm not terribly familiar with the way Dewey uh, your line on his work uses it, but uh, I was just a bit startled when uh, you uh, um, quoted uh, Bourdieu mm -hmm. uh, uh, because Bourdieu uh, doesn't use 
uh, the word habit, but the latent habitus. Yeah, yeah. And so I would like to ask you about uh, 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 the relation between habit uh, as a pattern of behavior or uh, uh, something like that and uh, habitus as a disposition. So uh, which is the notion you, uh, you are using? I think they are compatible uh, from mm -hmm. my point of view uh, because uh, uh, habitual behavior is the outcome uh, of an in internalized uh, implicit memory, which in turn is the outcome of the dynamic historical shaping of the uh, potentialities that, that our body uh, 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 makes available. Uh, uh, so uh, it is because we have these dispositions that we can uh, uh, produce uh, uh, behavioral uh, practices, uh, in particular social behavioral practices, which are uh, those uh, 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 that are at stake uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, because they are made of those potentialities. Uh, and the, 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 the minimalist beauty, <laughs> potential, minimalist beauty of this model is that uh, uh, with the same model, you, you are able to uh, um, explain, uh, account for both the production and the reception of the habit, because they are based on the same uh, uh, basic uh, neurophysiological principles. Etra. Okay. Okay. That clarifies it. Thank you very much. Right. I see Derek has his video on now. Derek, can you hear me? Would you like? You had a raised hand, hand earlier. Would you like to ask a question? Derek Hodgson? Well. It's not unmuted. No, it's not unmuted. I'm not sure he's speaking. So I think you might have problems with his connection because Maybe. the Maybe. image seems to be frozen. Okay, well, is there anybody else? who would like to ask a question or make a comment? All right, well, that's right about time to wrap up. So we can set you free, Vittorio. Before thanking you one last time, I would like to remind everybody that our next seminar, as Silvia has already said, is scheduled for uh, two weeks from today. So on the 20th of May, that's a Friday again, and uh, at four o'clock, so that's a slight uh, uh, change in the timetable, four o'clock European Central, Central European time. Um, but yeah, I mean, today was a, was a great start to the, to the seminar. So please join me in thanking again Vittorio for his great talk. Thank you so very much, Vittorio. And thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you for your time. Bye and for inviting me. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend. Grazie, Vittorio. Ciao. Ciao, a presto.